Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to your self-publishing questions answered live. This is a live version of a podcast that Sasha Black and I do every month for the Alliance of Independent Authors. Um, we are streaming to a lot of different places. So we're streaming to Facebook, uh, my YouTube, my own personal YouTube channel, Author Level Up, also the Alliance of Independent Authors, Facebook, and all the other places out there. This is our inaugural live show, by the way. So we're going to have some fun, you know, just bear with us as we w get some kinks worked out. But uh, we're here to answer your guys' questions. So uh, there, I rec we recognize that there are going to be a lot of people who are like, what is this? What What is this show? What is the value of it? You know, why are you guys talking at us? <laughs> so what we thought we would do is just do, just real quick, um, you know, for people coming in, uh, we want to get to know you first. So we have a desperate, desperate burning question. We want to know what country you're from. Okay. And then also the number one thing that you're struggling with as an author right now. And while you guys are doing that, uh, maybe we can type that in the chat too. So I'll uh, do that. Number, yeah. Okay. If you can get that, Sasha. So number, uh, what country are you from? Because we have to know, we, we love to know, we love to see people from all over the world. And then what's the number one thing you are struggling with as an author right now? All right. That's, that's what we want to know. And so while you guys are typing that in, I, I, I thought maybe, Sasha, we could just do quick introductions of Let's ourselves. Do, yeah. do you want to start? Sure. So I am Sasha Black and I am Allies Content Strategist. I used to be the blog uh, manager, but I have moved on to uh, a new role and Holly is now the amazing blog manager and she truly is as well. Um, so I am an indie author, of course. I write nonfiction writing craft books. I kind of teach, do speaking. I am also the host of the Rebel Author podcast. And then under my fiction pen name of Ruby Row, I write adult um, uh, sapphic fantasy romances. So I think that's probably as much as you need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all good. And and um, you give people the name of your podcast? Oh, just, the just Rebel people, Author you know. podcast. Rebel Author Podcast. Yeah. So great podcast. Be sure to subscribe to that too. So, well, awesome. So I, I'm Michael Laron. I, I'm Ally's Outreach Manager. I've been with Ally for, gosh, I know, probably five, six years at this point. I'm a self-published author, a author of over 90 books. I write science fiction, fantasy, self-help for writers. Uh, like Sasha, I also speak and I teach and travel and kind of do all the things. And I also have a personal YouTube channel called Author Level Up. And um, some of my subscribers are here in, in the chats and good to see them. But uh, yeah, you know, we're both we're both authors. We're both kind of living the dream, doing it, writing, editing, teaching. And we're here with Ally, the independent or the Alliance of Independent Authors. So for those watching who have not heard of Ally, Sasha, do you want to give like a quick elevator pitch of who we are and what we do? Sure. So, I mean, when I talk about Ally, I'm probably not giving the official pitch, but the way that I have always seen Ally is as like an unofficial union for indie authors. So if there were a union, I feel like Ally would be it. And the reason that I feel like that is because Ally have a multi-pronged approach to their work with the community. So they provide educational materials such as the blog where they have hugely in-depth articles and also bringing on some shorter sort of quick answer ones uh, where we also feature members. We have our like community hubs, which are kind of in the process of changing, but have been for the longest time, the Facebook forum. And and then we have the podcast, which is also educational and gives a, a platform on the Sundays to some of our members who are very inspirational. And then we also do like government campaign type, you know, broad spectrum work where we campaign on behalf of all indie authors to advocate for the changes that we need. Um, and that could be anything from lobbying Amazon or Audible as the hashtag Audible gate was. Oh my goodness me. Was that last year, this year? I, time is a lie. I forget. Yeah, I think it was last year. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, they've like lobbied on behalf of um, like ebook tax issues and all kinds of different things. Um, and so that's kind of where I feel the union type aspect comes from. And then we also do like one on one help for authors who get stuck as well. So some of that comes in the form of answering questions, solving problems. Some of that comes on the behalf of giving advice, whether it be like licensing sub rights type advice or other things. So it's um, and I've probably forgotten a whole bunch of things that we do but that's like a very broad brush um yeah yeah that was great that was great yeah we're, we're a nonprofit organization for authors and you know this this show is you know, one of the cornerstones of what we do which is providing uh, free and valuable information to the public so and we have a ton of public with us tons. in the comments yes we do so let's take a look at uh so so while we were talking we had some people uh chime in here on where they're from uh, so let's see. We'll just highlight a couple of them. We unfortunately we have so many comments we can't read everyone. So just know that we see it. We see you. We we know you're out there. Yeah. So Bull Bull Garlington is from Chicago, and number one struggle is building an engaged email list. And we have uh, Lynn from Vermont, and um, wanting to know what venue will be best to reach uh, my audience. So hopefully we can get to that a little bit later. Lynn and Diane, uh, number one issue marketing my book. We hear that a lot. Yep, we we do hear that a lot. Uh, Sue, uh, selling self published books that came out a year or more ago. Okay, so how to sell books that are on your backlist? That's an interesting, interesting problem as well. Um, anonymous proxy from the UK and number one struggle is lethargy. And we'll read one more here. And hello from England. I struggle with context swapping between my day job and writing. Yeah, that's that's I, I sometimes have that problem too. So we're, we got a we got a lot of people, Sasha. It's amazing. We do. I'm very impressed. I'm very excited yes. to have everybody with us. I hope we get lots of questions. I know. Well, we were we were preparing because this is like our inaugural show. We're like, okay, what do we do if it's just me and Sasha staring at a wall? <laughs> so we had like a program already, but I, I don't I don't think we're going to need it. I think we have lots of questions here. So uh, just real quick, uh, public service announcement. If you like what you see here today, Sasha and I answering your questions, um, the content that we're providing, Sasha and I do have a monthly podcast and it's every month and it is called the Self-Publishing Advice and Inspirations Podcast, uh, the Ally Member Q&A. And that's available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, you can just search search for um, uh, the Self Publishing Advice and Inspirations podcast or the Alliance of Independent Authors, and we go live or not live, but our our show goes live the first Wednesday of the month, and um, yeah, it goes live at one p.m. London time on every major podcast network. So if you listen to podcasts on Apple Podcasts or Overcast or uh, what are some other ones, uh, Google Podcasts, Podbean. Blueberry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's tons of tons of them. We're we're pretty much everywhere. So uh, we, you you can get us in your earbuds every month. And that show is what we do is we answer our ally member questions. So our ally members, if you if you're not a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors, you should be a member because you can ask us questions and we answer our members questions online. Now this this format we're doing a live quarterly show where we're opening it up to the public, but we answer tons of questions every month. I think since I've been on the show, um, um, gosh, I think we've answered over over a thousand different self-publishing questions. And you name it, you know, writing, productivity, energy, marketing, ISBNs, you name it, you know, we're we're a pretty good resource for you. So with that, Sasha, what do you think? Should we just jump into questions? Yeah, I reckon so. And I did see a couple come through. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm able. No, I don't think I can select them. So I think that's a that's a you, Jobby. <laughs> it's a me. Okay. Okay. So I will be in charge of the question question showing. So Lisa Downey's asked a question. I don't know if you can see her. Okay. Um Whilst you're looking for it, I'll tell you the question, which is, is applying for awards worthwhile? Okay. So, yeah, 
applying for awards is something that um, we we actually offer a service. It's free to the public. Uh, it's it's a basically the self publishing awards and contest directory. So we have a watchdog who looks at awards and just judges them based on some of the intrinsic value of of the different awards. And we we try to try to spotlight the 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 places that do a good job of good job of helping authors with the awards and that are a good value. Um, that being said, there are some predatory and and not so scrupulous award services out there. So I, I think the first thing to ask is why do you want an award? If, if it's, if it's truly just for, you know, to make you feel like you've got credibility or to make your book feel like you've got credibility, maybe you don't need it, but there are some reputable awards out there that can really help you market your books. So we would encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, we'll post a link to that in the comments. Um, but yeah, Sasha, what are your thoughts on on awards? Yeah, I think that there are times and places where it is worthwhile. What I don't think they're worthwhile for is for gaining new readers particularly. Because it, the thing is, is that if you're doing it for sales, it's not the most time and cost effective way of gaining new readers. Readers typically look at the cover, they look at the blurb, they look at the reviews. Those three things are like the trifecta of, um, and then the look inside as well, if you have that in Enabled. Those are kind of the four, four things, I think, I think possibly in order in which readers go to to um, decide whether or not they're going to buy a book, whether or not a book is an award winner, unless it's like, you know, the and now I can't think of any famous awards like the Costa Award. No, what is it? The Booker Prize, for yeah, example. Yeah, or Writers of the Future. Exactly. Another, yes. OK, so Writers for the Future. Yeah, has a particular science fiction and fantasy type audience. Um, the Booker Prize has a particular audience who will go and buy those books every year. But if you're looking at some of like the smaller awards, they're nice. They're nice to have. It's like, do you have the time? Do you have the money to apply? If yes, do it. If you're doing it because you want to um, get exposure or find new readers, I think that your budget is best spelt spelt elsewhere, <laughs> spent elsewhere. Um, but look, I've applied for awards. I applied for an award this year because I was new in a new genre um, and I wanted uh, some kind of validation to, you know, show that uh, I was a uh, valid author in this genre. So I do think there are times and places when it's worth it, but also I didn't put, you know, stacks and stacks of time and energy into applying. I just applied and I'll let it be. Exactly. So, so if if we can be of assistance and and being a resource for you, I did put a link for those who are watching live to our awards directory in the chat. But for those who may be listening to this after the fact, um, you can look us up at selfpublishingadvice.org, and then along the top hand directory menu, uh, there's a there's a, a a menu item for ratings. Just hover hover your mouse over that, and then there is a page under that that's called award ratings so you can check that out and uh, our watchdog john he does a really good job of, of rating services and if you're like huh you know this looks like an interesting award service but i'm not quite sure check it out and and we'll we've done a lot of legwork and, and if for some reason there's there's a service that you know you you're looking at that is not covered on that page we'd like to know about that as well because we're always adding new new services to the directory Okay, next question. Please stay out of my dreams. Um, <laughs> great handle. All right, so uh, in the United States with self-publishing, where do you even start? I am quite confident with writing, but the process of self-publishing and getting your book to people is very overwhelming. What are your thoughts, Sasha? Okay, so you can, for all intents and purposes, just get the book formatted, which I can tell you a couple of things about that in a second. And then you can just upload it. Self-publishing can be as overwhelming or not overwhelming as you want it to be. Um, so in terms of getting the book out there, how do you make a Word document or a Pages document uh, or a Google document for that matter into a book? Well, you format it. There are pieces of software that will do that for you. For example, Vellum on the Mac or Atticus, which works on Mac or PC. Or you can download a template from places like Readsy or Draft2Digital. 
they will give you a template that you can drop your document in and make sure it adheres to the instructions that are in the document. Then you then they will transform it into the correct file, which is an EPUB for the most part, broadly speaking. That's for the ebook. You then create your account, whether it be on Kobo or, or Apple or um, Amazon KDP, and then you fill out the boxes on KDP or the metadata or wherever you're loading the book up, then you load the EPUB and you load your cover. So obviously you're gonna have to have gone to a designer and gotten a cover. And then you hit publish after deciding your pricing and making sure you filled out all the boxes. And that really is as simple as it is to actually get the book onto these platforms. The, the complexity then comes with, well, you know, the timeline of, should I do this? When do I get an advanced reader? How do I get reviews? All of that stuff can come afterwards. But in terms of self-publishing, the actual mechanics of it is almost the easiest bit out of it all, because it's certainly easier than drafting than editing the book. And it yeah, feels sure. easier for me than marketing, too. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's there's no shortage of resources. I you know I think that the the hardest part is just finding the right resource. Um, but really though, you could go just go on YouTube and just type in anything you want to know. Right? How do you upload your book to KDP? And just look for something within like the last. And KDP is it stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. That's Amazon's um, self publishing division. So th there's lots of people who have done videos on how to upload a book to KDP. And I, I bet you could probably watch a five, seven minute video and then you would you would know the basics of, of what you need to know. And in addition to what Sasha said about, you know, how do you prepare the book? You know, there is the formatting and there is the, the cover design, but you can hire people to help you with those things. Yeah. It's just a matter of how, where do you find those people? And, you know, Ally, again, we can be a resource for you on that. So start start at selfpublishingadvice.org. You know, there's that's that's our blog. We've got tons of, of content there. We've got, and it's, it's free. You don't have to be an Ally member to take advantage of it. And just go to the blog and search for what you're looking for. And, and I bet you'll be able to find something that would be a good start in addition to YouTube. So that's the nice thing about self-publishing is that, yes, you know, there... Sasha, you, you and I have to wear a lot of hats as self-published authors, right? I mean, we have to be business people. We got to be editors. We got to be marketers. We've got to run a business, you know, and, and all of that, you know, all of just that I, th I think can be overwhelming. But if you take it one piece at a time, it's not too bad. And you just, you kind of learn as you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Anonymous Proxy. No problem writing, but once finished, I can't be bothered with any of the promotion, marketing, and practical stuff. Can you advise if there is a magic organization that will do all this for me? Um, I hate to tell you this, Anonymous Proxy, no, there, there really is not a magic organization that will do it all for you. Um, you know, there are publicists out there and marketing agencies out there, but your, 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 your success and your results are going to vary. And I think it just boils down to the marketing adage, which is, you know, 50% of marketing works, but nobody knows what 50% is that actually works. So, you know, marketing is not, you know, it's, it's, it's not the funnest thing to do as a, as a self-published author. I would just encourage you to find ways of marketing your book that you do enjoy. So yeah, maybe you don't enjoy, maybe, maybe you don't enjoy advertising or you don't enjoy writing the book description or whatever that may be. Right. But th th there are some things that you could probably find that, hey, maybe you're not that bad at. Maybe you feel comfortable doing it and, and double down on that. You know, I think that's the thing about marketing is, you know, a lot of people feel like they have to do things that they don't like. And so they shoehorn themselves into doing things because they feel like they have to. And then, of course, you're going to get lackluster results. Right. Um, Sasha, what do you think? Well, I think what we need to say is that the reason uh, it doesn't work is because for every service that you purchase or or sort of uh, commission, you are reducing your return on your investment. So let's say your royalty that you get is two pounds per book. That means you've only got two pounds to play with in order to get that sale. 
So if you hire a TikTok person, a email writer for your mailing list, if you hire an ads expert, each one of those is going to take a chunk of that, say, for example, two pounds. And the thing is, you are still going to have to manage all of those service providers. So no matter what, you're going to have to get your hands dirty at some point in the process. So I haven't heard of a single organization that could do it all for you, but I know that you could outsource all of the different aspects, but you're going to have to spend time and money outsourcing, and it's going to severely hinder your potential for earning a a positive return on your investment. Um, I certainly know that most authors eventually hire out some aspects of their business because you get to a certain point with growth where there is only one of you and you have to pick and choose the things that are important and how you spend your time. Um, So, you know, eventually most people do hire things out, but not all of it. (laughs) I don't know anybody that would hire all of it out. And even with a traditional contract these days, it's really unusual for um, them to do everything for you. I mean, highly unusual. You have to really be getting like a whopping, you know, high six figure or seven figure um, traditional publishing deal before that will happen. Yeah. And and even then, how do you how do you know that it's going to work? Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, it's 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 never it's never the answer that uh, we like to give. I mean, I I certainly wish I could outsource all of my marketing and just be done with it and just sit in a dark room and write books all day every day. But um, there there is unfortunately some elbow grease that you have to to expend. But I think the key is just everything Sasha said. Just remembering the the costs and your time and how valuable your time is, and just find find the things that that you can do that that will help you win. Okay, uh, we got a question from LinkedIn. Uh, Chris from England, if I publish jacket a jacketed hardback via Ingram Spark, how do I get it on Amazon? Oh, uh, Chris, I feel your pain. So here's the thing: I just released a book on the 26th of October, all three formats: ebook, paperback, and hardback, and still on the 18th of November, they are refusing to merge the formats. They their stance is that unless you publish the hardback through the KDP dashboard, they will no longer merge the formats. So I don't know how you do that. But my response is that I'm setting up a Shopify store and I'm going to direct all of my readers to my hardbacks on my store. And um, I will remain, you know, neutral on this ally podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us how you really feel. Sasha. Whoops. Uh, I'm very neutral on this subject. But if you'd like an alternative option, I would suggest setting up your own direct store. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it took it took me like I, I, I released a paperback on Ingram and it took like 90 days for them to merge it. Ugh. And I and I, you know, emailed them and, you know, I got I guess I got a little bit luckier. But yeah, it's not. Yeah, I don't I don't know why it takes them that long to do that. They didn't with my first book back in February in this new series. And I got quite a lot of hardback orders, which is why I'm so upset. Um, But anyway. Yeah. Well, when you set up your Shopify store, you have to let us know how that goes and give us your tips. Because more and more people are starting to do that. And I I think there's a that's an area where uh, I think that's that's one area where we haven't answered a lot of questions on. So I'll be doing it over the Christmas break. So awesome. Uh, Sorry, just to follow up on this, somebody's just asked, what does it mean to merge? Um, And so when you go to a book sales page on Amazon, for example, it means being able to see the ebook, paperback and hardback format options all in one page. And what we're experiencing is because we publish ebook and paperback through um, Amazon, those two appear. But then the hardback, which has a jacket on it, doesn't merge so that they you have to search for that in a different way which obviously severely reduces your sales potential because people will go to the ebook page and then click for the hardback so that's what it means yeah yeah thanks for clarifying that okay uh, next question is from diane i'm getting ready to publish my second book in a series of three or four books any creative tips for marketing a second book well first off that's amazing yeah. Congratulations, Congratulations on that. 
Yeah. Um, I would make sure your back matter, so the, the pages in the back of your book, are up to date. The best uh, thing that I have found is that as soon as you have finished, you put the full stop on the last sentence. Um, I hit enter. I do not put a, uh, what's that thing called? An, a break, a break, uh, an ornamental a page break. break. No, oh, a, yeah. a section break or a... Yeah, you know, like the asterisks. Asterisk. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, ornament, yeah, ornamental break. Yeah. Ornamental break. I do not do that because that creates friction. And if you're, if they're reading on a Kindle and there's an ornamental break, it could push them to go to the next page. So I literally hit enter and then I do my call to action. Um, so when you um, have the second book up and if it's on pre-order or if you're just putting it live, make sure you go and edit the back matter of book one to make sure that the, the buy link to book two is in the back. Then I would discount your book one and try and get some like newsletter promos, apply for a book bub, try written word media, all of those places. See if you can um, reach out to some authors in your community, in your genre, and see if they'd be willing to, to let their readers know that your book's down on sale. Um, and then just try and push as many people as possible uh, to it. That's, that's certainly... Um, what I would do. You, you you could do other things like running a paperback giveaway on your book one and try and collaborate with other authors in your genre. Basically, um, the best thing to do to sell book two is to sell book one, which sounds exactly. bonkers, but it is. That's that's the way it works. Unless, well, well yeah, you're absolutely right. So, uh, Diane, we're assuming that you have a sequential series yes. where you are required to read book one in order to understand book two. Now, if you have a series where people can start anywhere, then I think the game is a little different. Mm -hmm. Then you can you can start. You actually could do all the same things that you're doing. Everything that Sasha mentioned, um, you could do for book two as well. And you could, you know, do advertising and push book two a little bit more. Um, I think if that's the case, then an, probably something you should consider is on your website. Make sure that you have a reading order where you know, either it's a chronological order that readers can start or like a recommended book where people can start. So, you know, you've got two books at this point, it's probably not that big of a deal, but long-term, once you've got four books, if the books are truly standalone in the series and they can jump in anywhere, I think that's, that increases your options. I got, like, I wish I wrote more series like that personally, like, cause I, I always tell myself I would, I would be so much easier to market if I did that. The, the read through is lower though. It Ask can me be. how I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it I, is, I think of like, is, yeah. Even with an with a running plot through, the read through typically mm -hmm. is lower. But it's usually because you don't have as good of a cliffhanger. Um Right. Because the book is pretty much wrapped up. I mean, you kind of mm -hmm. have to write you know every you can't leave too can many make, loose ends exactly the people who make yeah. it work are like for example um you know like small town romances where it's a a, a group of five brothers and like that and each book is a different brother like those kinds of interconnected yeah. standalones really really work well i'm sure there are others but that's just the first one that came to my to my mind well yeah i think of like the big big name authors like like a james patterson you know oh, like yeah. you, could, you could technically pick up any alex cross book in the whole series right or like uh clive cussler the dirk pitt books like i just think you know yeah the they're, you definitely have to be careful what's that do the characters not age like they don't have no any they don't any... oh that's i mean so they, they, they pro well I, they can they, they certainly can age but typically the story is you're going to have a very similar structure hmm. you know the structure is almost identical like it's it's you know so no matter what you do when you pick up one of the books you get a consistent experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But again, I, you know, it, it, again, that's most, most series are not like that. Most series are, you start book one and then you move on. So yeah, fun, fun question. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's our next question. It's from writing for children with Karen. And uh, can you repeat the four things readers look at when making a decision to buy? So the cover is the number one, the blurb, the reviews, and then the look inside. Yep. Okay. Uh, next question is from JR. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to mispronounce your last name. So just from JR, uh, advice on marketing and what to do after no one buys your debut book. 
<sighs> okay, so I would ask you how much you considered the audience and the genre before writing the book. So when you go to a genre, had you read in the genre? Um, had you understood what the expectations were? Is there a particular length? Like, were, were you delivering a book that was um, to that genre's expectations? Does your cover match and look like it fits in that genre? There are so many different ways and means of diagnosing that issue. Um, some of it can be about exposure and visibility. Um, it's really hard to answer this without knowing like more about the book. But typically, if a book doesn't sell, either the cover isn't working, the blurb isn't working, um, or you have missed something in terms of the content inside the book. It doesn't quite mesh with the genre. It's slightly off what the market actually wants. Um, or you haven't quite reached your audience. Perhaps it's about visibility and just not driving enough traffic to it. Because the thing is, there's a very low percentage of people that actually convert. So you have to send a huge amount of traffic um, to your book in order to get people to buy it. So yeah, those are kind of the key things that I would look at. Um, and, and in in general, focus on like the the things that readers look at, right? So focus on the cover. Is the cover right? Focus on the blurb. Does the blurb match, you know, the expectations in the genre? Is it copy written, for example? If those things are right, then look at the, the contents of the book. Is it just, are the tropes right, for example? Is, you know, if you're writing, I'm going to butcher it, but like if you're writing fantasy romance, for example, you know, do you have an enemies to lovers plot? Or do you have, um, for example, Faye are very popular right now, you know, like, are you writing something that readers want is the is the question. So it sounds awful, yeah. but it's not I mean it, I don't mean it awfully. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm trying no, to help it, diagnose the issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you gave a lot of really good, good, good things to think about. Um, yeah, it, timing is everything as well. I mean, that first book, you know, it, it's tuition. It really is. I, I think uh, if if you look at my first book, it's probably true of you too, Sasha. Like, you can see all my hopes and dreams and fears in that book. <laughs> and I, I it, it took me a lot to learn, right? So the experience of publishing that first book is um, also very valuable, even if it's not successful. Yeah, my first every, everybody has one. Well. Yeah, my, yeah. my first book doesn't sell either. And yeah. that's okay. It's yeah. okay. You just take the lessons to the next book. But JR has another question that I want to follow up with, which is my last book, I spent $4,000 on editing. Book two, I'm spending 4500 How do I keep this up if no one is buying? Oh, I... That's a, that's a lot. That is an awful, awful lot to spend on editing. I would caution you about spending that much money yes. um i would suggest that uh, maybe have a look at uh software like pro writing aid um that will help you it gives it's very user friendly very intuitive and it will give you um instructions on like improving sentence clarity grammar all of that kind of stuff and i Actually, it's Black Friday week and they're doing a 50% sale. So I yeah, suspect we can get a lifetime license for a couple of hundred pounds um, or, or an annual license for less than that. I don't quote me on those prices, but I think it's something like that. Um, and that will do a huge, huge amount of the work for you that an editor will. And then um, I would then go and look at an editor. And depending on the type of edit, so for example, let's just say, an 80,000 word novel to 100,000 words. For a developmental edit, I'd look for any price range between about 800 pounds and about 1500 pounds for a developmental edit, which is the story structure. It's a huge amount of feedback mm -hmm. that they give, a huge uh, editorial letter and then inline comments. So that is the most comprehensive edit. Then you'll get like the copy in line edits, which could be sort of 400 to 800 in that price range and then a proofread which would be anything probably from 200 to five or 600 um and i personally don't use all three you might want to but what i do is i use writers who are at a sort of similar level to me um and i get a really intense critique from them which i then give back to them so i exchange skills uh which saves me a huge amount of money and then i use pro writing aid and then i pay for an editor 
And then I ask my advanced readers to pick up on typos. So, you know, I'm not spending really, I spent sort of a couple of hundred, 400 pounds, whatever it was on pro writing aid once that was a one off cost. And then I spend, you know, for 80 to 100,000, maybe 500, 600 pounds on edits. Granted, I am 20 books deep now, but even still, I probably the most I ever spent on an edit was maybe eight or nine hundred pounds. I certainly don't spend four thousand on editing. Yeah, I would just find a cheaper editor, Jr. I mean, there there are so, <laughs> that's a much there quicker are so, way of saying that. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are so many editors out there that you know you can find somebody at your budget level. Yeah, um, gu guaranteed guaranteed there there are enough editors out there you know what we don't know is how long your book book is so you know maybe your book is quarter of a million words okay you know then take everything we said throw it out the window but assuming your book is not that long i would just maybe find a different price point yeah okay uh tony horror writer is your own publishing company a great advantage i'm thinking about getting an llc so Go ahead, Sasha. I think that's a question for your accountant because it's a usually a text-based answer. That's is, what I was going to say. Yeah. 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 There are advantages yeah. and disadvantages both ways for being um, self-employed versus an LLC, but the best person to get advice from is an accountant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most, what we, our experience with most people is what we see people start with, and, and this is true in the U.S. as well as the U.K. and probably most other countries. But most people start off as a sole proprietor or a sole trader, and that essentially means that there's no there's no difference between you and your business. Um, there's also legal considerations, but we won't go into that. Um, but a lot of people start off as a sole sole trader and they e will either evolve into an LLC or a corporation later. But again, that's a decision you really, you don't want to make that decision without talking to an accountant mm. first because there, there are tax consequences, but yeah, I mean, assuming you want to be able to publish your books through a pub, through your own publishing company, that definitely looks more professional, right? So, but yeah, talk to your accountant before you do that and uh, just make sure you're making that decision for the right reasons. Okay. Um, also from Tony, do you ever recycle writing to increase production? You ever done that, Sasha? What does that mean? I, I think I, Tony, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think what you're implying is, you know, do you ever take bits and pieces from books that you've published previously um, and, and, and use those in current books? Um, for my nonfiction, I sometimes quote myself, which sounds very egotistical. <laughs> I do <that> too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean that black, right? So. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but it makes perfect sense, right? Because that's also like genuine marketing without it being like if you've already answered the question that comes up in a different book, then it, you know, I think that's a legit thing to do. So I definitely quote myself. In terms of like the other ways that I recycle is like sometimes I'll write a scene that then ends up being cut. And sometimes I might give that to my mailing list, for example, or I might then turn that into a short story or like a side quest that I then use as a reader magnet or something. But I don't think that I particularly recycle. I certainly have a sort of pattern where one of the chapters in a book then inspires another book kind of thing where I realize I want to go into a topic in more detail. So I might lift a couple of bits from that to, that then gets expanded into a complete book. But no, that and the sort of using fiction scenes for newsletter content and stuff is probably the most that I do in terms of recycling. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't recycle with my fiction at all. I do it all the time with my nonfiction, though. Like if I'm writing a a writing book and I'm trying to make a point that I made far more eloquently two or three years ago in one of my other books, I'll just say, Hey, in this other book, I, you know, and I'll just paste, <laughs> just paste the chapter, you know, so you could do that, but yeah, th there's definitely some, you could definitely be creative. You just don't want to recycle a lot because then readers will start to say, well, what are you doing? Right. So do it strategically, do it, do it. So, do it. so hopefully they don't catch you doing it. <laughs> Okay, uh, Empty Cages Press, are book clubs a viable way to go? And how do you do it? Um, 
viable way to go for what? I, are, you, are we talking I'm about sales? I'm assuming for marketing. Yeah, for marketing or just book sales. I think these are like bookstores when you're an indie. It's a nice to have if you've got the time and inclination. I think if you are after increasing your audience and getting more sales, there are better ways to spend your time and energy and potentially money. Um, you know, it, would it be nice if if you had a local book club and you had set a book series locally, I'm sure that would be a great way to market. Um, but typically book clubs are small unless you're talking about like Reese Witherspoon's book club, um, you know, or Oprah or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what are the what's the couple in the UK? Anyway, unless you're talking about those massive ones, but, you know, they don't take indie books. They take trad books. Right. So I, I would probably say no, um, unless you've got the time and energy. Or you're that type of writer that would benefit from it, which is yeah. a very rare breed of writer. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I your time think and money one would example. Be better spent elsewhere. Like um, Adam Croft did the Rutland crime series. And if there were like read book clubs in Rutland, I could think that would be a good example to, you know, to do it, but not really. I can't think of another example. Yeah, I can't either. Okay. Another question from LinkedIn uh, from Joshua. At what point for sales or success should you consider creating audiobooks? Well, they need... If you do an audiobook and your ebook is not selling, your audiobook is not going to sell. Um, you need to be able to see that your ebook is selling well enough that you will be able to get enough like income to pay for the audiobook. So, I mean, it, if say the cost of creating an audiobook would be say two to three thousand pounds, then I would want to see sales far in excess of that for an ebook before I would consider creating an audiobook because it's going to cost yeah. you two or three thousand pounds to get the audiobook. Well, that's so just for one book. Yeah, exactly. That's not counting if you have a series. Yeah. I mean, when you have a series, you're you're talking five figures. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Audio audio is tough because you know there are some readers that only read in audio. So like by by not having your book available, there are some people that are just never going to buy it. But the, the what you don't know is, is will that actually move the needle in terms of your book sales and how long will it take for you to recoup that two or 3000 pounds? And the answer is it could be a long time. And, you know, another thing about audiobooks that we, uh, we talk about quite a bit that we recommend, we don't recommend any sort of royalty share. So if you're going to produce an audiobook, it's best to do it up front, which means you pay the money up front to the narrator. Um, and so that can be tough too. So, yeah, you want or, your book you sales can, to be good. Or you can consider selling the sub rights, which is a whole different com business conversation and decision. Yeah, but it goes back to what you said previously. You've got to have really good ebook sales yeah. before you know any sort of agent or company is going to want to license the audio rights. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, probably your money's better spent elsewhere un unless it's something you truly want to do. But wait till the sales can justify it. Yeah. And the only other exception to that is if you do nonfiction and it's sort of that first person nonfiction um, and you are so inclined and have the time and the um, nous to want to learn how to do it yourself. Because, um, you know, I've we've both done audiobooks ourselves for our nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So it's not, nice. a, not an impossible feat. Yeah, it's it's not impossible, but not for the faint of heart. <laughs> really, really, it, it, it will take you ten times longer than you think it's going to take you. But so, it does get quicker. <laughs> it does. It does get a little bit quicker. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, audio audio is fun, but yeah, it can. Man, it's one of those things where you wish it was a lot cheaper. But okay, uh, Christina, how soon should I design my book cover? I'm still in the first draft phase, but is it beneficial to start that early? Oh, how long's a piece of string? I know people that leave it until they've finished writing the book. I know people um, yep. that forget to even do it after, and then suddenly the book's in edits, and they're like, oh my goodness me, I don't have a cover. Um, or you could be like me and do it when the book is still in the infancy idea phase and get it super early. 
the real question is how much do you know about covers in your genre and how long is the lead time for the designer that you want? Those are the two questions you really need yep. to ask because you can't go to a designer until you understand the cover expectations in your genre. Um, and then once you do understand that and you're able to write like a brief and usually they'll give you like the questions that will make up the brief usually. Um, uh, and if you if you know that kind of information, then you need to find out how long the queue is for your designer. And that should then determine your timeline. Yeah. And then another consideration too. everything you said is perfect. You know, another thing to think about is if you design it too early, there's always the risk that it could change. So you just want to make sure that, you know, if you do when you design it, you got to make sure it's set in stone, because if not, then you don't want to have to engage somebody to change change it so ask me how i know about that <laughs> <laughs> ask me how i know yeah yeah how many t I, I can't tell you how many times I, I would design a cover and oh crap man i'm gonna yeah. change the main character or i have a whole uh, cemetery in my iCloud of covers <laughs> <laughs> yep i think that's true i i think i've got a few too where yeah. i you know i i try to i try to delete them because it's just depressing because you know oh, you, no. you, you I, paid them. I, I try I just, to think uh, of ways to use it. them <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. I is the ones I had. I can't use. Like, there's just either I write a whole completely different story just for the cover, you know, and yeah. Then I feel like I would choke if I did that. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, next question is from uh, Mary Angelis Navarrete Lopez. Can I self-publish my first novella in two languages, written, illustrated, and translated by me? Can you give me advice on writing from the fringes? My novel is with beta and sensitivity readers now. Can you do it? Well, yeah, nobody's going to yeah. stop you doing it. <laughs> what yeah, I would I... recommend is that you get whichever is your first language. Obviously, it's really difficult because I don't know how bilingual you are or trilingual or, you know, whatever. Um, so it's sort of ignorant of me to make assumptions. But one of my friends has just um, published a children's book. They speak German and English. Um, and they actually had a translator work with them on their children's book, even though they are fluent in both languages, purely because there is, it was like a rhyming um, children's book. And so there are nuances to how rhymes work in those two languages. Um, so even if you are super, super native, sort of na at native level in both languages, I would recommend that you get advanced readers to just have a read um, and make sure that it all reads coherently. Um, so sort of people who are native or, or that's the right word, isn't it? But like first language in those two languages that you are publishing. Yeah. in. Um, and as long as you're getting the go ahead from those two, then I don't see why you wouldn't do it. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's a rare skill. Yeah. You know, I, you know I, I've talked to a few authors that have the ability to do that. And I just I so admire that. So if you want to do it, go for it. But I, you know, just 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 recognize, like Sasha said, you can't nobody's superman you know, yeah you, you, there's probably one out of the three that you're going to be killing it with and maybe there's one that's maybe it's your achilles heel you know so just think about that you, you even though you may have the ability to do it you may still want some help to some degree okay uh next question is from bull is there a community of spas who solve the dilemma of affording professional or semi-professional services in payment or for payment in kind um, I might offer a design jacket in exchange for editing services, for example. Yeah, but you have to find them. <laughs> so I do exchanges yeah. all the time. So um, I've got author friends who, um, like, essentially, we developmental edit each other. I mean, it's not cool to that, but that is tantamount to what we do. Um, and that works really, really well. But, yes, if you've got other kinds of skills, you can definitely do that. But it's literally just a... Um, case of making friends like i know that's hard as an adult i yeah, find it yeah. tricky as an adult but yeah that is the, that's how you do it yeah and if you want to meet i mean th that's the benefit of the benefit of joining an author community so they're they're you know you take your pick you can't you you can't swing a bottle of water without hitting some sort of author community these days so there's plenty of them out there uh, i think you could join a few find one that you like uh, ally has one if you want to join ally We've got a Facebook forum. We've got a lot of great authors in there where you can find maybe, you know, just put a post on there and see if you can find somebody. But, you know, just just be expect some trial and error in the beginning. 
Okay. Uh, Lisa, this is a question that we uh, harkens back to what we talked about earlier. What is the editing program you were talking about earlier, Sasha? Pro Writing Aid. I'll drop um, a link in the comments. Yes. And I think it's just ProWritingAid.com, all spelled out, if anyone is interested in checking them out. I, 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 I've used Pro Writing Aid for a long time. Um, if, you can, if you can afford the lifetime license, that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, next question is from Tim. I received a favorable review and recommend buy from Kirkus Reviews for a middle grade novel. Will librarians consider an indie book for schools? Should I promote the review to them? So should I promote the book to librarians is the question. Okay. Um, I'm not able to post the link in the comments, but. Um, oh, you're somebody, not? Okay. No, I'll, I'll it's, it. it's not It's not letting me do it. Um, oh, okay. It, yeah, so I received a favorable review and recommend by. Hmm? Yeah, uh, Kirkus gave him a favorable review. Okay, so he want he wants to know, you know, should he, can he, and should he target librarians in his? Mind? I mean, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there is like a process that librarians go through to get their books. Um, often they use things like the bookseller and there's like um, catalogs. So getting your book into those catalogs would be um, a good option and working with schools. We do have a guide to working both with uh, children's books and also one for how to get your book into a library. Um, so I would recommend reading those. I'm not an expert on either children's books or working with libraries, but I know that we do have the resources that explain um, how to do that. I think with anything where you need to almost go like one to one, where you're trying to build that relationship, because that's what you would be doing with a librarian uh, is building that relationship. You just have to understand that it will take time and it takes a lot of energy and you know getting your book into those places you might sell five copies for a school library but you're not going to be selling 55,000 copies which will pay the mortgage you know <laughs> so yeah yeah a slow and steady one that one yeah i i would also say okay so you meant you mentioned a few things um the the alliance of independent authors we have some guidebooks for our members that if you're a member of ally you can join and you get i don't know it's like 10 to 15 books that are free and one of those books is is uh, your self-published book in libraries or your book in libraries worldwide so if you are an ally member that's a that's a a resource that we have available to you for free um if you want to join let us know um we can we can connect you with that um another thing that you can do with libraries is uh, a lot of people have talked to me about libraries recently and um libraries apparently have or librarians have conferences like like annual conferences that you can go to they're open to the public and librarians are always looking for books so you may want to think about finding the local librarian conference in your area and going and seeing what the reception is um, and then also there are various ways out there where you can email the librarians and let them know that you know your your book is out there it's been reviewed by Kirkus, um, you know that sort of thing but also you want to make sure your distribution is right so you want to make sure your pricing is correct and that your book is available for librarians to buy. And don't quote me on this, but I think the distribution network that they use, is, isn't it uh, Baker and Taylor? I think it's Baker and Taylor. For um, the physical ones and Overdrive, I think. And it will overdrive naturally. Yeah, you'd want to have it available there as well. But 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 if you distribute your books through draft to digital or um uh, Publish Drive, I think, as well. All the big ebook aggregators that self-published authors use. So I would just start with Draft to Digital. Uh, they distribute to those places, and then they allow you to set library pricing. So typically, people set books for library books that's you know what two to three times higher, mm -hmm. just because the books are going to be circulated more. So you know, make sure your pricing is on point, and make sure your distribution is on point before you go to the librarians, and then that. And then after that, it's kind of up to you, <laughs> up to your marketing and sales skills and, you know, whether the librarians are receptive to, to what, you're, what you're trying to, to sell. Okay, uh, Willow asks, next year is the 100th anniversary of a historical event, which is the Mount Everest expedition. How can I market my book? 
to I'm that. So assuming the book is about Mount Everest? Assuming. Yeah, we'll make a reasonable assumption. If it's um, not, then I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But assuming your book is, you know, it's, it's tied to Mount Everest in some way. I mean, you could find out what events are on and potentially have like a stall there. You could run your own event, your own kind of appreciation event. You could work with other authors who write books similar to yours and run maybe a series of lives or um, you could do a discount or sale on the anniversary date. Um you could do some content marketing around mm -hmm. the historical Everest expedition, try and get on some podcasts that maybe travel podcasts that are that ha that have an interest in perhaps the Himalayas or, um, you know, expedition podcasts or, or travel pitching to travel magazines would be another one. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, you, you know, your niche better than we do. You know, we, we can really only give you, generic advice on that but be creative be creative i mean i think anything is fair game okay uh wylan wylan asks i'm wondering the best way to to just try um i believe it's dictation without spending more i only have use of one hand so typing is very hard should i just use my phone or speech to text um, depending on whether um, or not you have a Mac, Mac dictation software is actually pretty good. Um, and that's like an innate accessibility. Um, uh, uh, yes, it is. Button? It's not the it's, right yeah, it's word. Built in. It's built in. Yeah, into built in. All the keyboards. Yeah, yeah, and it's pretty accurate. So if you have a Mac, I would suggest just switching that on and giving that a go. Um, what else? I'm not sure what else because I don't use dictation. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. So, so dictation. Yeah, I, I recommend starting with the, the phone speech to text. I, it's one, it's free. Two, it's in your pocket, and there's no. It's not going to cost you anything, right? Now, it's not Dragon. You know, you're not going to be able to do some of the sophisticated things that you can do with Dragon, but it's not a bad way to, to start. Um, try it out. Get used to it. See if, if you could see yourself doing it. And then what I would do is if you are willing to commit, you know, you're willing to put a ring on it and really get into the dictation, then consider purchasing Dragon. And then you could use, you can actually still dictate into your phone. You can dictate into a voice memo app, and then you can upload that into Dragon and it will transcribe your your text. Yeah. Or even so, other places like otter.ai or Otter. Descript. Descript. Descript is another one. As yeah. Well. There's quite a Those few relatively cheap pieces of um like web software as well that's good for translating it yeah so i i would start there and um and, and just you know just kind of dip your toe in the water and see if you like because some people don't like speaking the punctuation and you know all that stuff they, they don't like saying sasha comma i don't like dictation because hyphen hyphen you know it's just it, it it just never gets, it doesn't feel natural. So try that and, and see if that is helpful. Okay. Uh, next question is from Elaine and the question disappeared. Okay. Is it true that indie publishing has become the way for midless authors while traditional publishing has become more feast or famine? I think that's an opinion. We can't provide necessarily facts behind that i think there is i think the industry is changing i think what people want in the industry is changing i think that a lot of people want independence or control over their intellectual property and if that's the case either being hybrid or being indie published is far easier to get that control in terms of feast and famine, you typically tend to find feast or famine in a very mature industry. Um, you could argue that publishing is very mature, but I think as technology changes and as um, you know, as the system evolves and the industry evolves, you see different things happening. So. For example, in 2011, 2013, when the Kindle was first new, it was what they all call blue water, which means the demand was higher than the supply of books. Now, 
that's not necessarily the case in the really popular genres. But if you still go to niche genres, there are still areas where there is blue water. I am in a blue water area right now. Um, so I think it I think it depends. I think that this is an opinion question. So everything that I've just said is my opinion. Um, and I'm trying to be diplomatic. But yeah, read of that what you will. Yeah. OK, so I'll be a little bit less diplomatic. Okay. So, th- th- yes, it can be the way for a lot of authors. Indie publishing can be the way for a lot of authors, but you got to walk the bright path, meaning you have to learn all the different things that you have to learn. So, you know, just because you self-publish, that doesn't mean you're going to be going to be rich. You know, you have to build a business. Ask us how we know. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You have to build a business and there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears involved in building that business. And if you're willing to do that and you're willing to maybe stretch outside your comfort zone and do some things that uh, maybe you didn't think you could do, then yes, there's no doubt that there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of authors who are making a living from their work, or at least making enough that satisfies them professionally and artistically. And Um, I think the one thing that you have to come to indie publishing knowing is that this is a long game. The more books you have as an indie author, the more likely you are to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, it's true that you can be successful with traditional publishing as well, but you know, the odds are against you. So, I mean, unless you're, unless you get lightning strikes, you know, it can be tougher. And, you know, remember that when you sign a traditional publishing contract, you no longer own the rights to your book. So you don't have that control. Whereas with self-publishing, you do have that control and and you can control your destiny. Now, what, what that destiny is, Sasha and I don't know. But what we can tell you is that we we talk to people on a regular basis who have been successful, who have walked this path and been successful. So, um, yeah, this I, I happen to love this path. I think it's it, it's been the way for me and and hopefully it's the way for you Elaine. Uh but we just want people to to walk this path with a clear eye and not you know just think you're going to jump into it and become a millionaire. That's how I started. I thought my first book was going to make me a millionaire. Mm-hmm. And then we you know I think everybody everybody thinks that to some degree, but it you know and then you come back down to reality and you realize what you have to do. So okay, so we are coming up pretty close to the end of our session. So why don't we, we're, we're going to, there's so many questions, guys, this is great. We, we really love this. Um, if, if we don't get to your question, it's okay. We will put it in the queue to answer on our podcast. So you can tune into our podcast and, and hopefully we'll be able to get to it quickly. And, um, yeah, so, okay. So next question is from Sebastian. Is it possible to record your audiobook for free? by recording it on GarageBand and then editing it yourself? So I started with Audacity, which is a free piece of software. And then I paid about 50 pounds for Amadeus Pro. Um, And yes, I built, well, not me, Royal We, my wife built an audio booth box, kind of like a, kind of like a telephone booth that we insulated with um, carpet and audio paneling. Uh, And then I recorded the audio books and did, um all the editing the editing takes way longer (laughs) than the recording (laughs) yes yes it does but yes you can do it for free (laughs) yeah you can just make sure you get the right software um you 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 know like i said i i probably would not do it in GarageBand personally um i wouldn't do it in audacity either so you know your free options are are kind of limited if you don't do one of those two especially on a mac I would spend just a little bit of money to get an app. Um, I used Reaper for my first one. I think that was like $60. So, you know, no matter how it shakes out, you're still coming out ahead if you don't hire a narrator. But yeah, definitely you want the right tool. Okay, uh, penultimate question. How do you pitch or market a book that doesn't fit any existing genres? I find this question very difficult. <laughs> um I would pick the elements that are closest to a genre and market them. So there's nothing wrong with writing books that are cross genre or don't fit a particular genre. 
that's fine. You can find some readers. But what you need to do is manage your expectations on how easy it will be to find those readers and how easy it will be to sell. It's not saying that you can't sell it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is readers typically go to a bookstore or a digital bookstore and click a genre to find the books that they want. So by not writing in a genre, you're instantly making it harder for readers to find you on a platform that's already got a lot of books. So that's why I'm saying pick the elements that are most obviously part of a genre and use them to market. Yeah, that's exactly I have, That's I have nothing else to add to that. Okay, uh, final question, Sasha. What are some strategies for writing more and increasing writing productivity? This is from Kareem. Uh, what are your thoughts on prompts, free writing, et cetera? Oh, this is one of my favorite questions. Yeah, me too. So I went from taking six months to write a book, draft, to being able to write a book in three weeks. The way that I did that was I went and did my Clifton Strengths. So Clifton Strengths are like a psycholo psychological profile, like a Myers Briggs type personality test. Um, and you can find it on Gallup dot com. Um, and I then went and got coaching. Now, I didn't know that I'm number one competition. So I'm yeah, everybody drink. I am hyper competitive. Um, and I had no idea why I didn't know that. I don't know, because my wife laughed in my face when she found out that I didn't know <laughs> that I was competitive. But anyway, um, and I also have a strength called achiever. What this means is that I really love like achieving things, ticking stuff off, getting a gold star and a sticker. Uh, so I discovered a piece of software called owrite.co. And in owrite.co, you can write with friends. You can't see what they're writing, but you can see their word counts. And being the competitive person that I am, I did not want to be the loser in terms of the number of word counts. So I went from being able to write about 1,700 words to 2,000 words in a whole working day to being able to write two and a half thousand words in an hour. And that was just by understanding who I am and what processes work best for me. Now, I've got some friends who are hyper consistent, right? So for them, what works best is a lower word count, but writing every single day. So they might write anything from 500 to about 1500 words a day, every day, day in, day out, without fail, even on Christmas, even on their birthday, even on whatever days. Now, that does not work for me. That exhausts me. What doesn't exhaust me is burning really hot and hard and smashing out the book in a very short space of time. Um, so really, the question comes back to you to say to, say to you, OK, so the first thing I think you should do is track, track what you're doing now. Um, to see, you know, what time of day are you getting the most words? When do you feel like writing? When do you feel the most creative? Um, have you ever experimented with friends by writing on Zoom, for example? What was the output then? Um, have you tried writing with brain music or classical music? Have you tried writing in a cafe? Have you tried? Really, it comes down to experimentation and just seeing. But in order to experiment, you must, must, must track the output of your productivity. And then when you see those things that do have a more beneficial effect, do them again, repeatedly, forever, full stop. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It. I mean, I, I'm, I'm. This, this is one of my favorite questions too, because this is just how I'm built. I'm just wired for productivity and efficiency. And Sasha, we have some of our strengths in common, so I'm an achiever as well. So my, my advice would be. Um, I'll tell you how I had to solve it for myself. So I had, I have a pretty crazy lifestyle. Like I guess have a lot going on. And I realized at one point that I like, I'm only going to be a one book a year writer. If that, if I don't make some changes. So I learned how to write on my phone. So when I'm, you know, in line at the grocery store or sitting in doctor's office, waiting on a doctor cause they're late or whatever, I, I have, you know, I had, I use Scribner for a long time. I use Microsoft Word now to where I can just pick up the app and I can pick up where I left off in the novel. And I've trained myself 
to be able to do that. And so I discovered that 40% of my work counts at one point were coming from adopting these apps. So you can change the way you write. That's one way to do it. Um, you can increase the amount of time you're spending writing, which most people don't have the ability to do because if you have a full-time job or a family, that's kind of hard. Or you can use tools and technology to streamline the process and make things better. So for example, I use used to use Microsoft. When I first started, I used Microsoft Word and that didn't work out very well because I was fighting with it and I was cursing it out every night and it was cursing me out. It just didn't work. So I switched to Scrivener and Scrivener made things so much easier because it had all the tools, you know, that made it simple. I've got two last things to say. The first one is it's ohwrite.co. O is in Oh, H. Yeah. So, oh, H. Oh, okay. R the word right then dot co. Okay. Um, and, and the second thing is keep experimenting because what yeah. might work for a while might not work forever because life circumstances change. Really good example of that is that I used to not need as much thinking time. And as I've gotten older, I need more thinking time before I start writing. So much so that just today I was introduced to Plotter, um, which is a piece of outlining software that's completely radically changed my ability to outline much, much quicker. I've gotten way faster. So I think even when you have processes, it's really important to keep an open, like a growth mindset and to be willing to experiment. And you might try things that don't work, but you might also find new bits of software that do work for you. So yeah, yes. just stay open to possibles. Be flexible. And uh, we did have some comments that came in that uh, just have to highlight real quick. Um, <laughs> Elaine says, uh, yay, gold stars. What a millennial. We are both millennials. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. We are millennials. So the jig is up. Yeah. Uh, now you know. Now you know who who is talking to you today. And then um, somebody else said, uh, there was another comment. Oh, how to solve the problem that Kareem brought up is... Uh, no sleep and a bunch of coffee. <laughs> I mean, that works too. <laughs> that that works temporarily, but then you yeah. may end up in the hospital. So, you yeah. know, for a one night thing, you know, I, I cannot confirm or deny that uh, that's, that can be effective, but uh, probably not forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, Sasha, wow. We've come to the end of the, our first show. It's amazing. Thank you all for watching. This has been great. And, um, yeah, so this has been your self-publishing questions answered live. Uh, we really wish we could have gotten to everyone's answers or questions, but uh, you know, tune in next quarter. Uh, we'll announce this on our social media platforms. Uh, I'll stream this on Author Level Up, my my podcast as well. So um, be sure to subscribe to Ally's YouTube channel if you're if you haven't, or subscribe to wherever you are right now watching this. And uh, just another quick public service announcement that if you found today's session helpful, Sasha and I do this every month, but on a podcast. So uh, it's called the Self-Publishing Advice and Inspirations Podcast. And it runs the first Wednesday of the month, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, yeah, this has been great. So we don't have the date set for our next session yet. But as I said, we'll announce that when it comes out. But it will be in the new year. So in the meantime... Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your writing. Uh, for those who are doing NaNoWriMo, good luck. You've got to be uh, over halfway to, to finishing your novel at this point. And we'll get to talk to you next time. Thanks, Sasha. Bye. Bye now.